Spend a few minutes walking around VRChat and you'll begin to notice something a little interesting. There's a lot of anime girls. Wait, 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 no, no, I'm serious. Take a trip to VRChat and visit any number of public or private worlds and you'll quickly notice that a lot of people are using anime girl avatars. Now, that's not to say that everyone is using an anime girl avatar, but like an abnormally large chunk of the game's user base, is. And a lot of the same population that's using these avatars don't necessarily identify with the gender that they're presenting as in-game. And a lot do. And some do, but only sometimes. And others do, but only in-game. Yeah, there's a lot here, so let's back up a bit. VRChat, if you're not familiar, is a game of sorts that allows you to interact with people and a virtual world where all of the content, including the avatars, are created by the users. The developers maintain the system that supports this, such as the infrastructure behind the servers and the code itself, but all of the content in the game is user-generated. If you don't know or you haven't heard of VRChat, then I would strongly suggest going and watching the first video on this channel called VRChat is Magical, which can serve as an introduction to what the program is and why I can't stop talking about it. If you do know what VRChat is though, then you probably already know that it's something of a playground of identity. In VR chat, you can be anything you want to be, anything you can dream up as long as you can build it in the Unity game engine that VR chat runs on, then you can basically do that thing or be that thing. This means that people often deeply connect with their avatars. According to a survey of more than 200 players that I did late last year, I found that 55% see their avatars as a representation of themselves in virtual reality. For many people, their avatar is not just a character in a video game, it's their identity. Gender, of course, is a pretty big aspect of most people's identity especially in regards to how we are seen and how we see others. Yet in VR chat, things get a little slippery. Most people in real life can't just press a button or flip a switch and change how others perceive their gender. In VR chat though, with a button press, you can do that. This is a novelty and a curiosity of VR chat. Any time that VRChat is mentioned on the internet, soon behind you'll see people talking about how everyone on the program dresses up as an anime girl, and isn't that interesting? This is such a common occurrence, like literally any conversation about VRChat, this inevitably pops up. In fact, in the last video I released on this channel, uh, there was a Reddit post about it, and in that Reddit post there was someone asking, why are you dressed up like an anime girl? Well, good news, that one specific guy on Reddit, I'm about to answer your question with 8,000 words. <sighs> I feel like this is something that gets just hand waved away about VR chat. Oh, uh, of course, it's just weird anime dudes doing weird anime dude things. But I think it goes much deeper than that, as should be obvious by that 8,000 words comment and the runtime of this video. Now, with that said, this is where I make it clear that I'm going to be saying a lot of things in this video, and not everything that I say is going to apply to every single user of VRChat. VRChat is played by like a million people at this point. It would be silly to just generalize what I'm saying here for everyone that plays the game. So yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. How can you play with gender in VRChat? How is this any different than an MMO? What even is gender in virtual reality? And of course, why anime girls? To answer those questions though, we're going to have to enter the fluid zone. Oh, I should have specified the, the fluid zones over there.
I, I should have clarified. When I said the fluid zone, I meant gender fluid. Would it have been better to call it the non-binary zone? You, you know what? It, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Let's, let's just, let's just get to the, get to the video essay. So there's a lot of ground to cover in this video, but I feel like the very first thing that I have to establish here is that like, yeah, the whole anime girls thing is actually novel and worth talking about in the first place. I'm sure that there's a lot of people who are either not familiar with VR chat or alternatively simply just are thinking, well, don't dudes play female characters in other games all the time? And yeah, they do. That's certainly the case. But two important things. First, VR chat isn't really a game. It's a social platform. And something like World of Warcraft, for example, you're picking and designing a character for a variety of reasons that often include gameplay elements. For example, you might play a human instead of a night elf because of stat bonuses. And something like Overwatch, you aren't playing Mercy because you really want to be Mercy, uh, some communities aside. You're playing her because that's the hero your team probably needs at the time. And of course, there's aesthetics. In most games, you're going to be looking at your character in the third person. You aren't them so much as you're playing them. The way armor looks on male and female characters is different, oftentimes in extreme ways. Certain race and gender combinations might look better than others. You might like how a night elf female looks in some armor or a human male looks in another. Sexual dimorphism is typically pretty divergent in games, so these can be pretty meaningful choices for how you look. In VRChat though, there isn't a gameplay or a meta to choosing your avatar. You don't get, I don't know, plus five to staring at a mirror if you rolled male or something. While aesthetics certainly matter, it's less because you're looking at your character and more because you are your character. It's a difference between subjectivity and objectivity. As a veteran MMO player, I've often heard about people talking about dressing up their character in armor, treating it like a paper doll of some sort. In VR chat, while I do sometimes hear people talk about collecting meme avatars or avatars of their favorite characters from whatever media, uh, when you talk to the folks that only have one avatar, which by the way, is the majority of users according to that study that I did, you hear different language being used. Typically, it's, this is my outfit. This is my avatar. Once again, subjectivity versus objectivity. We're talking about a perceived self versus a fancy object you are merely in control of. Now, I recognize that some people in MMOs will use their character's gender to signify how they want to be seen, but it's different. In an MMO, the very fact that your character is a character and not you, personified in the world, is notable. The social aspect that comes out of this is always secondary. It's there for the purposes of the game, but it isn't the game. In VR chat, on the other hand, the social interactivity is the point. If you pick a gender swapped character, you are deliberately saying, this is how I want to be seen. To really drive this point home, and I know that this will only work for some of you as it requires a good amount of community VR knowledge, what do you think when you see this image? I wonder how many of you said, that's Tupper versus that's Tupper's avatar. It's a small difference, but it's a very interesting one as far as our perception of others. Getting back to my main point though, the second thing I'd like to point out is that while aesthetics absolutely matter in VR chat, your point of view is also important, if not crucial. You are not viewing your character passively through the eyes of an observer, hovering 10 feet above your head. You aren't in the third person. Within VR chat, you are behind your character's eyes. You aren't puppeting them, you're possessing them. You aren't a disembodied head and some visible hands or arms. You can look down and see your body. If you have full body trackers, you can see your legs move. You can watch your hips, your chest, and so on. Now, here's where I need to make a relatively important note. There are functionally two kinds of users in VR chat, desktop and VR. 
you don't need a VR headset to enter VR chat. Based on the simple fact that most people don't have VR headsets, this means that there are a lot of non-VR users in VR chat. In public worlds even, I'd wager that there are more desktop users than VR users. Yet the further deep you get into VR chat, the more the ratio starts to skew. Once you start joining different Discord servers, different communities, attending events in VR chat, and just developing a friend group, you'll almost always be surrounded by people using VR headsets. Regardless, this split makes things difficult. There's a reason for that, and it's called presence. A lot of research that's been done over the last decade and change suggests that when people enter a virtual reality environment delivered by an immersive virtual reality experience, uh, essentially a HMD or head-mounted device that allows head or eye tracking along with extremity tracking, plus an actual environment to explore, they tend to act as if they are in a real place, engaging in real events. This experience in virtual reality is referred to as presence. The concept of what presence means over time, however, has deepened. Originally, presence was simply thought of as the sensation of being there in the virtual environment, but more recent interpretations focus on the extent to which people respond realistically with a fundamental distinction between the illusion of being in a place and experiencing events as if they were real. For many users in VRChat, it can't be emphasized enough that they are not just piloting an avatar that they like the look of. They are the avatar that they like the look of. They are inhabiting a body. The inclusion of things like the aforementioned full body tracking only serve to deepen this. This experience, I believe, goes pretty deep, and I think a good bit of evidence to that end comes in the form of something that's often referred to as phantom touch. Phantom touch is the sensation of being physically touched in real life based on what is happening to your avatar in virtual reality. This typically manifests as a slightly warm, tingly feeling on the skin, think music chills or ASMR, although some people will describe something more intense. This is so prevalent that I've found in many communities, users will establish certain forms of consent. Don't touch an avatar unless you've uh, essentially been invited to, basically. This is because some people in VR chat will feel and have real sensations based on you touching their avatar in 3D space. Obviously, that can cause some complex issues. Anyway, in this survey that I sent out, 45% of users noted experiencing phantom touch, with 16.7% thinking that maybe they experienced it, but they weren't sure. Only 38% of users said that they definitely hadn't experienced it. Phantom touch isn't the only manifestation of a high level of presence, however. Here's another interesting tidbit about that article. Because virtual reality is entirely programmed, the form or type of virtual body can be quite different from the participant's actual body, which can impact perception, attitudes, and behavior. A dramatic example of this is when adults inhabiting a virtual child's body overestimate the size of objects and demonstrate implicit attitude and behavioral changes that seem more childlike. With a significant enough amount of presence, we aren't just piloting a character we are becoming them. Virtual reality isn't just something that lets someone express themselves, it's also something that lets someone try on and play with a different identity. Like in the study, when the adults would pilot a child's body, one that gave them adequate presence, they would start to become childlike. They would take on the identity and behaviors of a child. This is fascinating. We've established essentially that in VR, some people feel sensations as if they are there, that they don't experience things as an illusion, but rather as if they were really there and present in that virtual world, and that our virtual avatars can influence and bring out elements of behavior in us. Choosing an avatar in VR chat isn't just picking an avatar you want to look like, it's not just putting a costume on, it's playing with an identity. It has a very real impact on how you behave and how you act. And of course, one of the aspects that you can play with includes gender. Now that we're through a good chunk of the introductory material, I was hoping that I could just drop all that and say gender and hope that I'd thrown enough at you to just have you believe it. But as it happens, as I was writing this script, 
I had a friend send me a study that was published in Nature. Literally, it literally just came out in December. In that study, the authors found that when they placed a virtual reality headset that achieved sufficient immersion on someone and then swapped the gender of the body they were in within virtual reality, the people in the experiment reported feeling more fluid about their gender. Here's an excerpt from the study's authors. The present study is in line with the general notion that gender identity is a softly assembled self-organizing system that involves dynamic coupling between relevant biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors, such as a person's hormonal and anatomical status, thoughts and feelings about his or her own gender, or perceived societal norms. When all these factors cohere tightly, gender identity remains stable, but when coherence is poor, gender identity is updated accordingly. What current results add to this perspective is experimental support that the perception of own secondary sex characteristics is an integral part of the gender identity construction process that can considerably perturb the sense of own gender in non-transgender adults. Clearly, being within an avatar and choosing an avatar can have some profound impacts on, well, who we are. Picking an avatar isn't simply about aesthetics. It's about identity, about who you are, who you want to be. It's about taking on a form and becoming it. Enough to feel like this isn't just an illusion, that this is another reality. Your avatar is a place where you can project yourself, and in a weird way, the avatar can project it back on you. For some, this means complete immersion in that identity, because it's theirs. For them, there is no pilot avatar dualism. They are one and the same, impossible to be separated. They can feel, they can touch, they can exist in this identity. Maybe it's only a plaything, something to try and then discard if things get too uncomfortable, or maybe it's a salve, the only method they can use to align who they really are with who they appear to be to everyone else. But realistically, all of these things aren't limited to just VR chat, right? The conditions that we've been talking about could happen in any virtual reality game. So then what makes VR chat different? And again, why anime girls? As the kids say, ooh woo. Through the first two videos I made on this channel, one on VR chat and the other on Classic WoW, I've held sacred the idea that the community guides games and online programs as much as any code does. And to that end, there are a few notable things in VR chat, or I should say the VR chat community, that I believe fundamentally alter how people approach identity. For one, VRChat is an amalgamation of many, many communities in a way that is unlike anything else anywhere on the internet. You have tech folks who are just interested in the latest new thing. You have deeply talented developers who are just looking to create on a new platform. You have experienced Unity developers. You have weebs from basically everywhere. You have a large portion of the community that came in through 4chan. You have a larger chunk that's moved in via their favorite streamer. You have fans of musicians. You have people explicitly seeking out a platform like VRChat and finding it, and so on and so on. All of these individual communities have melted together. VRChat isn't really like anywhere else on the internet. It's just a meta community, a jumbled up mess of subsects of other subcultures mashed together. At the same time, these individual subcultures haven't exactly lost their core identity. Likewise, as I said in my first video, the developers didn't court this specific community, and that's one of the things that makes it so special. When VRChat began, it wasn't targeting, say, the anime community or the furry community, but those groups came in naturally, and then filtered out throughout the whole game. VRC is a community where it seems like everyone brings stuff that they are just really excited about, and then tries to share that with others. It feels like that sort of vulnerability and 
earnestness elsewhere in the internet is met with cynicism and ridicule. In VRChat though, it's embraced. The lack of a sorting algorithm of any kind basically ensures that communities are destined to interact with one another in a fairly unique way. Elsewhere on the internet, you're almost always sorted into predetermined advertiser-friendly groups that end up pushing like with like. Now, this is going to be mildly auto-ethnographic, but in VR chat, I've experienced people being generally more welcoming towards people that tend to be bullied or ostracized elsewhere. But like, it's also not a hug box either. It can be quite hostile and quite welcoming at the same time in a way that's really hard to put a finger on. It's a place where you'll hear people using words that most normal people would recognize as slurs, while at the same time agreeing to use each other's chosen pronouns. I've watched two femboys have an argument about the curious trend of racist within their particular fandom? Uh, arguing about why that is, and if it's really a problem or not. That kind of conversation and interaction is just different. Overall, the culture of this place is, well, it's in the spirit of the old internet that I, you know, made a whole video about. Yet still, the culture of a place is really hard to place without actually getting in and experiencing it for yourself. Still, I realize that many people watching this are never going to jump into VR, so I decided to ask around and see what people had to say. These were some of the answers that I received. The VR chat community is difficult to define. It's a collection of immensely diverse groups of people who loosely share a vision to redefine themselves and their experience of reality with raw, chaotic human creativity, constrained only by the limitations of the game. VR chat is a place where a few months will pass and a shy early 20s socially anxious neat will turn into a dancer with an e-girl behind him, running her fingers through his hair. That's me, or was me. Also, a furry will become your friend and you'll be blown away by the swag avatars they make. It is so very weird. I've never felt comfortable with who I am. In VR chat, I just became comfortable with myself over time, despite how hostile people can be. For every person that would scream rude shit at me, there were people that would just want to sit down and have really long talks with me. I wouldn't even know them. It made me open up and realize a lot about myself and who I am. I've got to admit this, but I didn't know how to react the first time a cute girl walked up to me and had this big, burly voice. I was like, bro, what? Why do you look like that? And they just responded back, because I want to be cute, motherfucker. And I was like, fuck, man. I want to be cute, too. Our behavior, our identity, is influenced by the people that we are around and the groups that we belong to. It's basic psychology. Or, more specifically, we will moderate our behavior in accordance to the norms of the communities that we are part of. Social influence is profound, and our behavior will change due to pressure from our local or community groups. The way we see ourselves, the way we see others, the way we see our place in the world, our behavior, it's all dependent on the social groups we belong to, both large and small. It makes sense then, in virtual reality, in an entirely different group, fundamentally separate from, well, reality, one that has its own rules, its own conduct, its own culture, it makes total sense that people are going to behave differently. And that's going to have a profound impact on people's identity and how comfortable they are about sharing bits of themselves that perhaps they never have before. Thinking about all of this reminded me a clip I saw when I was in grad school. Think about how difficult it is for sissy boys or how difficult it is for tomboys <laughs> to function socially without being bullied or without being teased or without sometimes suffering threats of violence um, or without their parents intervening to say maybe you need a psychiatrist or why can't you be normal. There's a real question for me about how such gender norms get established and policed and what the best way is to disrupt them and to overcome the police function. It's my view that uh, gender is, a, is, is culturally formed 
but it's also a domain of agency or freedom. Judith Butler, if you aren't aware, and this is a bit of an understatement, is a relatively well-known philosopher who is most prominent for her idea that gender is performative. Gender isn't some innate thing, it's something that we perform. Now, even if your eyes are rolling out of your head and this is all too postmodern for you, you'll likely still agree with the basic idea at the core. The color blue isn't male. The color pink isn't female. That's relatively new. It actually used to be the other way around way back in the day. Surprise, colors don't have a gender. Who knew? These are arbitrary things that we assign to particular gender roles. These signs are completely dependent on what our culture says. Virtually every action we do, everything we display about ourselves is gendered in some way by society. But none of these things are innate. A baby doesn't pop out knowing that dresses are for women. We tell them that. Our culture, our communities define what these roles mean for us. When people push against these ideas, they're often labeled as an outsider, as another. This discourages people from pushing against these particular societal gender norms. It's important to note that it isn't just aesthetics that get tossed into gendered boxes either. Before Judith Butler penned Gender Trouble, where all the stuff I've been talking about originated, there was Candace West and Don H. Zimmerman who defined gender as the activity of managing situated conduct in light of normative conceptions of attitudes and activities appropriate for one's sex category. West and Zimmerman saw doing gender as being held accountable to sex category membership. To put it another way, we can break down individual actions and see how they become gendered, and from there we can understand how people can either successfully or unsuccessfully perform their gender. To them, gender wasn't something that you were, rather it was something that you achieved. A failure to live up to preconceived gender norms, for example, meant harsh judgment. So you always felt like you had to achieve gender, else you'll be ostracized. Understandably though, if we apply that same logic to something like VR chat, we get almost an inverse reaction. If the norm is play, if the norm is to quote that one guy above, to be fucking cute, then that's an entirely new avenue that's suddenly open to you. As I was writing the very first draft of this video, Harry Styles just wore a dress and it caused uproar. And I can't help but think about that and think about VR chat. That's something that would never happen on VR chat. If you hear a male voice on a female avatar, you probably won't blink an eye. If a major celebrity, if Harry Styles showed up in VR chat and was dressed however they wanted to, people would be like, yeah, cool. If they showed up as an anime girl version of themselves, there'd be literally no difference. Just neat, I guess. So what do we have so far? We have an environment that allows you to be an identity that you create, one that you can mold however you'd like, as well as an environment that is more welcoming of exploration, experimentation of things like gender than in the real world. But uh, okay, okay, why anime girls, Straz? When are you going to talk about the anime girls? So we're like, what, 30 minutes into the video and we're just now getting to anime girls? Hmm, that's some quality Straz content. Anyway, yeah, so why anime girls? I think it's a bunch of coalescing factors that all just kind of spill together. First, the VR bit. Why is everyone an anime girl in the first place and not say some other cartoon or humanoid version of themselves? The short version is that the anime community gradually set up shop in VR chat, aided by a mix of tools that enabled the easy, well, relatively easy, importation of MMD or Miku Miku Dance files into VR chat. At one time, believe it or not, not everyone had an anime avatar but that is kind of where the style went over the years. Most of the models that were imported in this style just happened to be cute anime girls. A lot of the bases, the humanoid part that the rest of the avatar is built around, were just amalgamations of MMD parts, and due to the clothes and whatnot that were already available, this meant that there were just more female avatar options than male ones. 
Notably though, male options did exist and certainly they do in 2020. Likewise, there's a large enough community of modelers in VRChat, so if there was equal demand, there would definitely be an equal amount of male and female avatars. Getting back on track here, I think the anime-ness of the avatars is crucial. I think the anime community and the subculture around it informs the usage of these avatars. I think there is perhaps a good comparison to be made here to cosplay. To quote Shane Anderson, writing in their thesis on cosplay, gender, and performance, Cosplay is performance art in which the actors bring the audience into their world for a time to experience their favorite fantasy. Anderson quotes from another scholar on cosplay, Nicole Amricks, who sees cosplay as a vital example of how identity is constructed. Fans construct their own identity by associating themselves with fictional characters and embodying them. Cosplay emphasizes that the self not only narrates fiction, but is partly fictional as well. It is through interaction with stories that we can imagine and perform ourselves. For those using avatars from or inspired by a certain anime, there's a direct link here. However, even for unique avatars, we can see even these characters as containing elements and tropes present in popular anime. OCs, or original characters, are often a distillation of traits that someone enjoys, aesthetically or otherwise. Cosplay lets us bring gender into the mix too. Crossplay, or cosplay in which you're dressing as a character different from your own gender, is a relatively common phenomenon. A brief sidebar here, I'm primarily focusing everything in this video essay on the Western English-speaking VRChat community. With that said though, there's no doubt that a lot of the Western practices in VRChat are heavily influenced by other non-English areas of the game. This is especially true of the Japanese VRChat community, which is obviously incredibly influential in a game defined by anime. To that end, I think it's important to consider the Japanese roots and culture around cosplay. I'll include an excerpt here from Alexis Hugh Trong's paper on cosplay. Defining cosplay meant situating it amongst a diversity of costume play practices in Japan, such as jōzō, male to female, and danzō, female to male cross-dressing, gothic lolita, visual k, kigurumi, costumes that cover the entire body, and even original creations, all of which were also at times identified as kosopure by participants. Through these practices, participants played with different sources in different ways. Taking gender as an example, it sometimes meant using the costume to play a categorized opposite gender and go out in jozo or danzo and have tea with friends while displaying an idealized Victorian era femininity through Gothic Lolita, and attend shows while dressed as visual female idols, themselves dressed as women, or even transform into characters whose gender was sometimes more ambiguous or absent, as in the case of animal or robot Kigurumi. Tron quotes a man named Tetsuya they interviewed in Tokyo. In my mind, I intentionally let go of the idea of doing things like a guy when doing Jōsō. I didn't act inappropriate. I still have the feeling of being a guy, but I think of making myself have a pretty appearance and not move in indecent ways. It's pretty much the same with cosplay. I don't really care about the character's personality, but I can use that character's material, make jokes, and if there's a layer or a cosplayer doing another character from that series, it's easier to get close. I can become more straightforward than I normally am, and it's easier to open up when communicating. Chan goes on to talk about how Tetsuya used these experiences to challenge certain aspects of masculinity, to play with gender. Later on, Trong talks about the other people he interviewed, about why they cosplayed. While they typically start with general things like, oh, it's fun, and whatnot, they'd often move on to an infinity for specific characters, what they liked about them, things they wanted to bring to their own identity, as well as a desire to change themselves. If we consider the cosplay community an outcropping of otaku culture, the same branch that very clearly influences VR chat, then there's a very easy connection to be made here. Trong quotes another cosplayer, a 28-year-old male PhD student. Recently, that's what I'm wearing. Even when I'm not doing Joso, even though I'm a guy, I wear women's clothes without feeling out of place. Just like that, and I go out. My friends and my girlfriend say it makes my butt look kind of cute, but the shape of my hips and waist look good. It makes me feel happy. Remember that guy earlier who just wanted to be cute? There's one more element I need to throw into the mix though, a certain detached, absurdist irony. One of the biggest user funnels of early VR chat was a VR-centric ongoing thread on 4chan. Thus, a lot of the game's early users and much of the game's culture was seeded from 4chan. 
This includes an affinity for anime and a low-key constant willingness to shitpost everywhere, but there's something else in the mix too. There's a certain kind of low-key ironic detachment from everything. It's like a warm blanket that allows people to never have to really confront their own feelings, from everything from personal failures to identity and, yes, gender. <sighs> I mean, I'm not going to go into like a, a history of 4chan here, please God, but even if your only knowledge of 4chan is like, I don't know, political shit, it's important to know that the biggest thread tying 4chan together is it's like postmodern detached nature that's chaotically swapping and bouncing between earnest opinions and just nonsensical trolling. Is someone telling the truth? Do they really feel a certain way? Are they just getting one over on you? Bringing things back to anime girls here and VR chat, there's always a certain level of like, how serious are any of these people being really? Do they really want to be anime girls? Maybe they're just perverts. Ha ha. Don't look too deep into it. There's nothing else here. Promise. That might sound like something that blows up everything I've been talking about, but only if you don't realize that such an attitude is exactly the point. It's a strategy. Thinking back to Weston Zimmerman, if you can fall back on, ha ha, it's just a joke, dude. This isn't who I am. You can escape that gender accountability that they talk about. If it's just a joke, then you can use that as a way of cloaking your true intentions and your true feelings. The sort of, ha ha, everyone is an anime girl in VR chat, ongoing meta joke, both reinforces the fact that, yeah, there are a lot of people who are anime girls on VR chat, and it also makes it a little easier for those that take refuge in it. That means acting as cover for men that just want to be cute, or for those that want to explore their gender identity, or even for those that already know they are trans, but aren't quite ready to have that conversation outside the metaverse. That's a powerful, powerful tool for someone navigating their own identity. When you don't have that level of irony or performance to hide behind, you are accountable for your gender performance. People trace it back to you, and you won't be able to escape the consequences, whatever those happen to be. That ability to have more control over gender, either through play or through the innate power in having your representation to others match your true internal identity, is powerful. So in short, that's why there's so many anime girls in VR chat. It'll mean something different to everyone, but at the core, it's functionally because the community meta present in VR chat allows for identity play through, well, anime girls. And like I said, that's going to mean something different for everyone. But I'd like to spend the remainder of this essay talking about two groups in particular. Out of the two groups that I really wanted to poke at here, I figured I'd start here first, because you see, there's been a certain tension in this video that I need to address. The way I've been talking about gender in this video is very much in the play category, or experimentation. I realized that this can end up having the result of reinforcing the idea that LOL, no women play games, all girls are just guys in real life, LOL. And this sort of attitude, especially in the context of, well, everything else, can be harmful for trans women, or trans people in general, really but especially trans women who were often brutally at the end of this joke. After all, if you do want to present as feminine, but you don't hit someone's internal measurement line for what it is to be female, then you're going to be seen as a man merely pretending, which that sucks. So let me stop for a second and actually nail down that when I say play, I'm using it as shorthand for exploring your individual gender identity in a way that you otherwise just haven't had an opportunity to do so. Play kind of implies an unseriousness, and that's intentional, but in a very delicate, specific way. It's unserious on the surface, in a way that allows deflection, but past that, it can be more meaningful. It might be someone, say, feeling out the limits of what they're comfortable with, but for others, it could be finally experiencing something that they've always wanted and finding joy in it. With all that said, an overall attitude and culture of gendered play makes things a little safer and a little bit more reassuring. 
Like, there's a pretty notable trans and non-binary population on VR chat, to the extent that in my own survey, a little less than 20% of participants did not identify as the gender that they were assigned at birth. That's just a hair away from one out of five users, and that's not a small percentage, all things considered. I've had a few conversations with people on VRChat where it was jokingly mentioned that one potential monetization solution for VRChat would be to sell programmer socks. If you're a little lost here, let me help you out. Programmer socks are really just, well, these. What do these have to do with anything? Well, because thanks to an old 4chan meme, having a pair of these as a programmer will improve your coding ability. Of course, the reason why this joke is popular is that for one reason or another, there are a lot of gender curious programmers, people who tend to be curious about their gender or maybe perhaps identify as gender fluid or they cross dress or whatever. They often are part of communities where these socks indicate a first public or private step towards exploring their own gender. Really though, as a joke, it also serves as a mimetic toy that safely allows someone to explore gender while staying within the confines of a joke. It's a rare space, even just as a joke, that lets those assigned male at birth explore gender, or at least aspects of their gender. Kinda like something else we've been talking about, right? VRChat is a little bit more intense than a pair of socks. Not only is this a safer environment compared to almost anywhere else to indulge in exploring your own gender, but it's also a place where if you don't need exploration, you can present as the person who you are and have people address you as such and do so in a streamlined way and a body that is yours. If you're trans, I'd have to imagine that's gotta be incredibly validating. I've met more than a few trans women in VR chat, and honestly, I've heard a lot of similar experiences from many of them. Here's a quote from a trans woman who I interviewed earlier this year. I tried talking with a few people, but my social anxiety would kick in and I would usually leave after a few awkward exchanges. Then one day while browsing an avatar world, I tried on a female avatar and it was an almost overwhelming feeling. I was looking at myself in the mirror and was like, this feels so much better. I didn't know it at the time, but I was experiencing gender euphoria. The same woman pointed out to me that a lot of trans discourse tends to focus around dysphoria, which then often becomes a sort of litmus test for those wondering if they're actually trans. On the contrary, within VR chat, she suspected that many people questioning their gender identity might feel euphoria instead once they find an avatar that works for them. Well, I don't want to put words in her mouth, this sort of meshes with what I've been building up here. VR chat can serve as a place for play, it's almost encouraged. This gives everyone, but trans folks especially, a place to encounter some pretty unique feelings, maybe even for the first time. VR chat meets people where they're at, and so for some people it can be reaffirming, whereas in others it can be a new discovery, the sudden obvious answer to a nagging feeling that was never really previously acknowledged. Remember what I talked about earlier in this essay, the sense of presence and immersion that VR chat can induce. I can imagine how that could be a euphoric experience. I can also imagine how it could help people suffering from dysphoria. Remember that new study on gender in VR I brought up earlier? Well, in a Reddit thread discussing it, there were some interesting comments. I'm not going to narrate these, but feel free to pause here to read them for yourself. For a few people I interviewed when writing this essay, the very first time someone used their pronouns without being asked was in VR chat. That hadn't happened at all for them outside of virtual reality, and in some cases they weren't even out yet for a variety of personal reasons. Of course, I don't want to overstate things too much here. I think the software enables these experiences to happen, and I think for the most part the community also assists. There are pockets of the VR chat community that absolutely do as is evident from the trans pride flags present in many of the super popular worlds. But of course, it isn't perfect. The woman I mentioned above was harassed in VR chat for not talking while in a female avatar. So yeah, 
things are a bit complicated. But overall, I think philosophically, at least, the environment present in VRChat does encourage a different sort of community than, say, the greater internet or reality. Even aside that, like, if you're trans and you like anime, I mean, what else are you gonna be? The, if you're anyone and you like anime, what else are you gonna be? Everyone should be a cute anime girl. Everyone should be a cute anime girl. Okay, I feel like I can't really get any deeper here. I want to, really, I, I really do. But I feel like anything more than this feels weird, bad, bad and weird? for me to be doing. I'm not trans, and like, I want to be careful here. I'm not worried about being like, I don't know, cancelled by my massive audience, but I am genuinely worried about saying something hurtful, or damaging, or misrepresenting a community that I'm not part of. I mean, haha trans girls cat girl programmer socks is already towing the line pretty heavily and I'm really gunning on this not getting that popular and mostly self-limiting to a VR chat audience that like uh is familiar with all of that like please fingers crossed I, I for that reason I am going to shut up now and talk about something that I, I have like a, a, a teensy bit more experience in, uh, like just a, li a little bit. I was lucky enough to grow up with loving and kind parents who encouraged me to always be whoever I was. But even then, that's not the same message I got from society. As a thin, short, scrawny boy without much of an interest in sports, my sexuality and masculinity was almost always questioned. That was the primary thing I was bullied for. Now most of my bullying fell off in high school, but those societal lessons stayed with me. And they didn't just come from high school. I can remember taking some time off sick due to what was an undiagnosed chronic illness and being called, essentially, a pussy. That wouldn't be the last time I'd experienced the wonderful intertwining of toxic masculinity and capital. but. I digress. To fit in, to be accepted, I had to establish my masculinity and perform it in a certain way. I think this isn't an anxiety unique to me either. In almost all aspects of my life, I've witnessed other men questioning either themselves or other men on a preconceived scale of masculinity. The absolute worst thing to be seen as is unmasculine, to be seen as feminine. Gender, even for cis men and women, can be a bit of a cage. You are expected to play your role. You are expected to perform your identity. This can have some dramatically dire consequences. For men, performing masculinity means performing solitary strength and self-sufficiency. And that's killing them. Men are less likely to seek help for depression. In the 12 months prior to suicide, only 35% of men, compared with 58% of women, sought out psychiatric care. There's also a positive correlation between a higher level of adherence to masculine norms and a higher likelihood of experiencing depressive episodes. A common observation was that beliefs and values deriving from adherence to the stereotypical stoic Australian male identity were unhelpful, especially when held in extreme forms. Almost all men reported that their masculine beliefs led to them isolating themselves when they were feeling down, for example, to avoid imposing on others. Failure to manage emotions or live up to expectations of happiness or coping also often led to a sense of lost control or guilt, as well as anxiety about having these perceived weaknesses or failures revealed. It was very common for family and friends to state that this tendency of men to adopt typically masculine responses to distress meant that they were often unaware of warning signs for suicide or misinterpreted suicidality as depression or anger. It's bad to be feminine in any way. It's weakness. Returning to that butler clip from way earlier, this is specifically what she was referring to. If you fail to perform your gender, if you aren't always exuding peak masculinity, well, you're a potential target. Call it toxic masculinity or anything else. It doesn't really matter. The end result is that if you are a man, you aren't allowed to embrace any aspect of femininity. To be clear here, by embracing any aspect of femininity, I don't even mean as far as like, wearing a dress or anything. This means both as far as personality or emotion. Say, 
showing empathy or crying or weakness or softness or caring about people. I I know it's behind us now because that's the way news works, but when President Biden is shown kissing his son in a moment of tenderness, a man that has lost so much with regards to his family, it's seen as pathetic weakness. Like, men, is it gay to love your family? I've heard conversations between both men and women talking about Men that had been on tough conference calls and had been seen crying afterward about how they weren't an asset because they were weak. I've heard people talking about men that dressed too well or too effeminate in the office, even if that means, God, just a purple scarf. That's the kind of thing I've seen get people pulled aside. Like, that's the reason why manvertising exists, right? It's a fear of using products that are unmasculine. God forbid we smell like pretty flowers. This is just the society that men are forced to navigate. We're so policed all the time with regards to how we behave, our sexuality, our identity. If we aren't existing constantly as lumberjacks just covered in 5W30 sawdust musk and who knows what else, then we might as well just kill ourselves. This isn't new ground. It isn't news at all. This is like some pretty 101 level stuff. Yet when applied to VR chat, in context of everything else we've talked about so far, doesn't it start to make a bit of sense? VR chat still exists within the greater realm of society, sure, but the virtual reality we inhabit here is different. It's a different community, a different subset of people. The norms within VR chat are different, and thus so is the gaze. It comes from a different place. The pressures in VR chat aren't going to be the same ones in real life. Here, everyone is a cute anime girl, so why not be one? I'm sure many people do it just to fit in, because it's just what you do. But for others, I wonder if it's a way to escape the crushing pressures of masculinity, just for a little bit. Here, you can be weak, you can be pretty, you can escape the constant pressure to be something that might not align with who it is you want to be. Yes, being an anime girl might be silly from the outside, but if viewed through this lens, It's understandable. It's a brief vacation from a crushing weight that every man has had on their shoulders since they were old enough to understand society's expectation of them. I think the aesthetics are important, but I think it's more about what they represent, even subconsciously, that's really important. I hear men in public worlds dressed as anime girls having straightforward emotional conversations with each other all the time. And not just good friends either, just people, random men, just talking about stuff they've been through. In some cases, the really difficult stuff, the traumas, both large and small, that are present in their everyday lives. These conversations don't happen in real life, at least not like this. But in VR chat, you can have someone sit down next to you as an anime girl and just open up in a way that would be frowned upon in meat space. Yes, there's trolling, and I'm not trying to give the impression, once again, that VR chat is this utopia. It really isn't, but occasionally you get glances of something else something different about this community. You'll see two people who identify as men sitting down as cat girls, talking about their day, patting each other on the head. And that's normal behavior here. No one bats an eye. And that's beautiful, honestly. And to be blunt, it's fucking needed. Through the gendered play in VR chat, men can break the bonds that tie them in. Like, am I saying that being a cat girl in a virtual world is therapeutic? Gender identity questioning aside? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am. If we live in a world where masculinity is hardness and emotional dullness, and femininity is the opposite of that, and by entering virtual reality, you can get away from that and become a little more fluid, and that means escaping all of those above pressures, then yeah, yeah, I I, I am. I am. I am saying it's therapeutic. At least a little. There are a lot of people that talk about how VR chat, or VR in general, might be dangerous. It might be this void of an escape that people run off to. And maybe that's true, but I think, really think, that there's something magic here. And I think it has to do with how comfortable people can be in their own skin, whatever that happens to mean. As I've said a few times, and will probably say again, I know that not everything I've talked about will apply to everyone. Not everyone is going to question or explore their gender when they put a VR headset on. Likewise, not every man is going to feel the need to escape their chains via being a cat girl. But I think there is potential truth in here for everyone, and I think it's important that each individual define it for themselves. 
I realize that's rich this deep into a video essay where I'm more or less kind of defining it, but really. For some, the gendered play present in VR chat will lead to meaningful discoveries about who they are. For others, it will let them experience gender euphoria. For others, it'll just mean escaping society's brutal expectations. And yet, for others still, it'll just be a momentary escape, a way to make friends or explore new places. All of these things are good and useful and worthwhile, and they all can be true at once. Oof. Ah. Ah. The fluid zone gets a little weird sometimes. The way I see it is this. VRChat contains a multitude of internet subcultures, of which the anime community is a relatively prominent one. Combine an otaku subculture that doesn't turn a side eye at things like gender bending and crossplay, add in the technological layer that enables presence, throw in a bunch of other internet subcultures, then paint all of that over with a layer of detached joking irony that lets people play around with gender without really having to explain that that's what they're doing to anyone else. Do all that, and not only do you end up with a community where it's okay to be an anime girl, but it's the norm. Everything I've talked about in this video makes VRChat a particularly inviting place for non-binary, genderqueer, and trans people. It tends to be a place where you can explore your identity or you can just be who you are without really worrying about judgment, at least as not as much as in the real world. Like, I was primarily inspired to make this video based on a lot of the people that I've met while playing VR chat. It's one of those things that you see everywhere in the program. It's not really hidden at all. Like, in VR chat, people just play with their gender. It's just a thing that happens. I don't think that there's many spaces where people can explore any aspects of their identity without judgment and that doubly goes so for gender. There really aren't many places where people can sit down and actually think like, what do I think about just gender? Most people don't ever really have to grapple with that kind of thing. But when all of a sudden you can jump into the body of someone different than what you assume you are and look in a mirror and feel like you're behind those eyes, well, that can have a profound impact. And like I said, even just beyond gender, we don't even think about our identity that much. And VRChat really kind of puts that in focus. It's honestly kind of funny to me that in this place where you're kind of forced to wear a mask, it feels like everyone can let theirs down a little. In VRChat, it often feels like you're getting the opportunity to talk to people on a genuinely real vulnerable level that you just don't get elsewhere. It's another reason why VRChat is a magical place. Anime girls are magical. They're magical girls. This is a funny joke. In the popular eye, VRChat is probably going to continue to be known as a meme-laden shit-posting haven. Yet I think this one particular meme that everyone on VRChat is an anime girl, well, I think it's one of the best things about the program. As I said before, it's just one of the things that makes VRChat magical. A place like this simply couldn't exist anywhere else. Thank you for watching, and thank you for making it through this long journey with me. God knows that this video, it's long, okay, and it took a long time to make. If this is the kind of thing that you like to watch, or that you like to talk or think about, then I would suggest you join my community Discord. The information can be found in the description below. Likewise, uh, subscribe to the channel, and send it to all your friends, I guess. But yeah, to next time.